Amen. 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 Okay. Seth, I need a little more, sir. How's everybody feeling this morning? Amen. Just, just give us just a second while we get technically correct. Okay. Good, sir? All right. I want to jump right into the word on this morning. I'm going to be jumping around from James chapter 4, Luke 17, Matthew 18, and also going to dabble a little bit in Mark 12. Okay? Just giving you those so you know where we're coming from. All right. Good. You good, Juan? You good, Seth? Are you all good? Everybody good? Yeah. All right. In Mark chapter 12, specifically around 23, verse 23, 24, it speaks of faith, or he speaks of faith, and having mustard seed faith, that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain and have it removed and cast into the sea. Okay. That's a very famous scripture. Most of us are familiar with it, probably for years or decades, and it sounds amazing. But to me, it's always been one of those texts that is hard to really truly comprehend. So we think about it not necessarily literally, but we think about it in terms to try to relate it to our own situation. And it's according to where your faith is. If I have faith this big, I should be able to speak to a mountain and have that mountain jump up off the face of the planet and dive into the ocean. Hard, it's hard to imagine speaking to a mountain and it literally leaping off the face of the earth, doing a swan dive into the ocean. It's hard to imagine that. But you can relate it to other situations where it may not be necessarily the size of a mountain, but it might be a situation or a large obstacle. Okay, so conceptually, not necessarily a mountain, but, but a, 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 a situation. I want to take this concept and dig down a little bit more so that we have an understanding of how to use your faith and so that we have a, a better working knowledge of how it intertwines with the power of love and accessing and tapping into the unlimited power of Jesus the Christ. Amen? Jesus spoke of cursing the fruitless fig tree. The figless fig tree. He spoke to the fig tree and he cursed it because it was not producing any fruit, any figs. It wasn't producing what it should do. So therefore, it was a, it was a fake. It was, a, it, was, it was an obstacle. For someone that was hungry, it wasn't able to produce something to feed them. Oftentimes, we have obstacles in our lives, and when they first show up, we think it's going to be something that would produce fruit or produce something that would better our situations as far as our lives or our livelihood or the way we love or the way we embrace. And once we really look closely at that situation or that obstacle, we realize that it is not fruitful. Sometimes we will curse the situation. In other words, we will speak to the situation to have it removed. But because it's a tree, it's something that has taken root into our lives, we don't always have the ability to immediately have it removed. How many people know what I'm talking about? Go with me to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7. I want to take my time in the setup with this. James, chapter 4, and verse 7. Speaking about how we speak to the mountain and have it removed. How do we speak to the mountain and have it removed? What does the mountain symbolize? The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers from all, all of them. 
all of them. That means no matter what's showing up as an affliction or, or as an opposition of the, the abundance that we're promised, he said that we would have life and have it more abundantly. So he promises if you will follow him. Jesus promises if you will follow him. The whole reason that he came and was died and then was resurrected is so that we could not only have life but have abundance. Then why is it so often that we as Christians have things that show up that are obstacles that are blocking that abundance? Because what he's doing at every trial and every tribulation is to strengthen your power, to give you more power, to give you the ability to speak to the obstacle and have it removed so that you can see the abundance that that obstacle is blocking. How many people know what I'm talking about? Easier said than done at first glance. Easier said than done until we have understanding. I would imagine that most of you, right now, if you really stopped and think about it, you have a great life. Except for some of you, maybe most of you, maybe even all of you, have an obstacle. It's blocking one area, or maybe two. But it's probably not more than one or two areas. The problem is that the obstacle is so big and has been there so long until you have accepted it as part of the terrain. If you look out your window every day, you live in your house for 15 years, and you look out your window and there's a mountain to the left. Every time you look, you know that mountain is there. That's part of the terrain. That's part of the scenery. If you look out your window to the right and it's a big tree, that's part of the scenery. You've accepted that that's what it's supposed to be. It's there, it's been there, it's going to be there. If you look out the window of your life and whatever area is lack, whether it's a need for, you might have a need of healing in your body, whether it's, and it doesn't matter what it is, you might get migraine headaches on a regular basis. And you know what? You just accept it that that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay? The doctor might say that you have cancer. Might say you have a tumor. Might say that, you know, whatever, the area of healing that's needed. Might need an area of healing with your family. Might be the kids, or it might be your parents, or it might be your spouse. You may have no longer, you may no longer have a spouse, and you need healing from that. Maybe you're widowed or, or, or maybe divorced. And you're still holding on to the pain and the residue from that situation. You may need an area of healing in your finances. Finances. Oftentimes, that's where the biggest trials are for the saints. Finances. Or something related to the finances. Your house, your car, your job, your future, your retirement. You thought I was going to have this much, and it's this much, or it's upside down, or the mortgage went up, or whatever, the car blew up. It's finances. Oh, God, how in the world did I get in this situation where I need this, this, and this? And, and the more I pray about it, the more it seems to get bigger, like the mountain is growing. And you look out the window to the left, you see the mountain is getting bigger. Hey, that mountain was bigger today than it was yesterday. Well, I'm just going to look over here to the right because God said I'm blessed. And I'm not going to look at the mountain even though it's right there in my eyesight. But I'm not going to look. I'm going to ignore it even though it, it continues to grow. Amen. We don't want to face it because it has become an obstacle or, or an eyesore in the perfect picture that we have in our Christianity when God is saying that he's given you the power to speak to that thing and have it removed and cast into the sea. Amen? Amen. That sounds good. Sounds good. But how do I do it, though? You know, I hear people, I preach all the time about, you know, we should just be 
happy and it should be smooth and flowing all the time. And certainly God said we would come that we, he, he would come and we'd have life and life more abundantly. And, and sometimes the way that some people were incorporated and weave it in is like it's no afflictions being a Christian. That's not true. It's not what his word says. You're going to have afflictions, but you have to understand how to overcome the affliction or how to overcome the obstacle. It's going to happen. It's part of the walk. It's part of who we are. But in the affliction is where you gain more power. You gain more power by speaking to that thing. Sometimes it's confusing because we're often taught that we, once we pray and give something to God, that we shouldn't keep praying over, about the same thing over and over again. And that is true. Everything he's done, he's already done. Everything he's going to do, he's already done. However, the distinction is that he has given you the power to speak to that thing yourself. You follow what I'm saying? Oh, come on, you ought to praise him. You see, if you think of God as a, as a corporation, he's the CEO, he made everything, he's the founding CEO of, uh, of Love Life, Incorporated. I mean, he, made, he founded it. He, he founded the universe. He made everything. He runs everything. If he's the big boss of the, co of the company and, and you work on the third floor and he's on the 17th floor, you're not going to run upstairs with every single thing. He's already given you the job description and given you all the tools that you need to do. And, and sometimes you need to go to him about some of the big issues. But if, it, if it's something that's part of your everyday job, you don't have to take it to him necessarily like that. Not every single time. God, you said that I could speak to the mountain and have it removed and cast into the sea. That I could. So God, I'm coming before you as humbly as I know how, and I pray that you bless me with the impartation so I can have more faith and more power. And in igniting that, God, I pray that you change my mindset so that I know that by the power it's already done. I pray that you remove all doubt and all fear that it wouldn't be done and that you bless me with how to speak to that particular mountain and have it removed and that you bless me with the results. And even, the, even if the manifestation is not instant, Lord, that you allow the manifestation in my mind and in my spirit to be instant so that I can stand on that and know that it's done. How many people know what I'm talking about? In the book of James, in the book of James, it speaks of humility. In, in verse 7 of chapter 4 of the book of James, it says, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that part about resist the devil, and he will flee from you, Oftentimes, that is a turn off for mature Christians. People that have been saved for more than 17 minutes, a lot of times if they see something like that, they, well, it's not applicable to me. I'm not sinning. I've been delivered from sin a long time ago. It's not what it's, that's not what it's meaning. The devil resists the devil in a situation when you're praying about an obstacle. The devil is pulling on the fear the insecurity, the areas of lack, the areas where your faith is not necessarily the strongest. That's what the word means. Resist the temptation to give in to the lack of what the circumstances look like in the natural. In other words, you stand on the power of faith and, and activate your faith by going higher in God, by having more humility to activate the love, the love of Christ, his love for you, activate it with your faith, produces the power and the ability to manifest whatever you need and more in the power of Christ. How many people know? Resist the devil and he will flee. Lord, bless me to, to remove the, the, the fear, the doubt, the insecurity, anything that would prevent me from speaking to the mountain and having it removed permanently and cast into the sea of forgiveness. Help me, Lord. Help me in that area. Then it goes on to say in verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Ah, see, that's hard right there for some people because as we get more into our walk, sometimes we forget how majestic God is. 
we forget how powerful he is. We forget that he is Lord of Lord and kings of, King of Kings. In other words, we forget the importance of reverencing him for who he is. If President Obama came in, and I'm a President Obama fan, and I don't care who don't like it, but I like Obama. If he came in, they would block off this whole section. The whole, the whole grid square would be blocked off. Secrets, uh, what do you call them? Secret service would be everywhere. They'd be walking in black suits and talking into the coat. They'd be frisking everybody. They'd want to know who you were because President Obama is the leader of this country. Okay, probably one, if not the most powerful man in the world, certainly one of them. We would reverence him. Even for the Obama haters, they'd have no choice but to reverence him. And if they buck, they're going to get dealt with swiftly. Do we give Jesus the same type of reverence? Like, really? It wouldn't even have to be a, a, a world leader. It could be, you know, but Beyonce and Jay-Z. They come bouncing up and everybody's going, oh, you know, so even if you don't like them, you're going to be, you're going to look and see, oh, they're, they're celebrities. Or whoever you can think of. I was thinking some, somebody worldly that everybody probably would know their name. You would reverence their celebrity. You would reverence President Obama's, his office, not the man or, or not the woman as the individual, but the power that comes with their position. That's what you would reverence. And if you got to, I see you, God, if you got too close and you weren't giving the respect that was due that position, you would be dealt with by the entourage you would be dealt with because you came against the security of that particular position. How many people know what I'm speaking of on this morning? But do we really do that for Jesus? Really? I mean, we often preach about being joint heirs, and certainly we are that. And we, we preach about the power, the privilege that comes with being joint heirs, and we always want to be more blessed, and we always want them to move on our situation, and we always want more, 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 more. But do we give him the reverence that is due him? Let me stay there for a second. Do you pray the same way when you don't need something as when you do? Same fervency, same frequency, huh? same humility. We want to be more blessed. What I've learned is that oftentimes as we pray to go to the next level, the next level of blessing, for God to move in a certain situation, for us to receive more, often what he seems to do is to pull back. He showed me the other day that the first piece of true abundance as it relates to prosperity, miraculous prosperity, is being at the place to appreciate what you already have. You want to realize how blessed you are? I dare you to go home and purge your closet. Go take all the stuff out that you don't wear. I ain't, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the stuff that you might wear. Uh, I'm not talking about the stuff that you want to say for two years. I'm not talking about the stuff you keep it because they had a certain label or a certain color or a certain sentimental value or, or you remember when. I'm talking about take out everything that you haven't worn in six months and you know you're not going to wear it for another six. Take it all out. Take it all out. Put it in a pile. Put it in plastic bags. And then see how much stuff you have that you don't use. But then you'll be amazed at how blessed you feel by what you have left over. 
Oftentimes, we pray for a new house, but before he'll bless you with a new house, he'll put you in the place to appreciate the old house. And you realize that in appreciating the old house, really, God, if you, if you didn't bless me with the new house, I'd be good with the old house. You made me fall in love with the old house all over again. Oh, how many people know? He may bless you with a situation where you're waiting for a miracle, waiting for a miracle, and he'll put you in the place of feeling like you're in the fire, but then he'll bless you with peace in the fire. So by the time the manifestation of that thing that you were praying for happens, you're already in such a peaceful, loving place with Jesus. Certainly you want the manifestation of the blessing, but you're good even before the blessing manifests. How many people know? <laughs> See, as he shifts you to get more power, he has to first shift you to the left so that you can get more humility. The, the power is in the humility. The deeper you go in him, the more power you have. The Bible says he who humbles himself will be exalted, but he who exalts himself will be humbled. See, if you're in the place of exalting yourself, even a little bit, even subtly, he can't receive the benefits. He can't get the glory. So he has to shift you. To where you see, oh my God, I was looking at it wrong. Oh my God, I thought I had some sort, of, so, some sort of sense of entitlement. When really I don't have an entitlement for anything. The only thing I am entitled to do is to give you the praise because you're so awesome, God. Oh, you ought to praise him. You ought to praise him. He said, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. So you're looking at the obstacle, the mountain on the left, and, and you're forced to go deeper into the humility on the right. And as you go deeper into the humility, your, your, your faith kicks in because you've, you've been empowered with more love for Christ. The faith and the love together gives you direct access to the unlimited power of God. And as you realize that, you realize that you have a different vantage point because you're praying for something to manifest, and, and somewhere in, in, in your faith you know he's already done it, and, and even though it seems like it's taking a while to manifest in the natural, he's shifted you into a place in the supernatural to where you have peace that surpasses all understanding, and, and the peace that he gives you gives you access to more of his love because he's put you in a place of more humility. It's a cycle. The more you get, the more you want. And the thing that, that caused you to have to go that deep in the first place, yeah, 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 you still need that. But he shows you that he's so awesome, he can put you in a place of suspended animation so that you can go much longer than you thought you could have, missing that piece that was right there. Oh, you ought to, ah. See, it's not even so much about that one circumstance. He's blessing you with the power to be able to speak to the circumstances from every point forward. It's not just about you, and it's not just about that one time. It's the ability to be able to understand how to access, understand the mechanism, understand the, the process. So it's then in you, and it's, it's part of you. And you can not only be a shining example to his kingdom, but you can also share it and, and teach it and impart it to the people that are open enough to receive it. Amen. Humility. See, the humility takes you deeper into the love of Christ. And you can access more of the love for yourself. You can actually fall in love with Christ. Somewhere in between where your prayer is no longer a chore. Yeah. Or something you should do. Or something you have to do. You know what I mean? The difference between somebody that, that cooks dinner because they, you know, I got to eat, so I got to cook. That's me. That's the type of cook I am. I'll cook because I don't want to starve. Okay, but I, there's some people that love to cook. I mean, they get happy. They start dancing, they're wiggling and whistling, and they want to share what they made most of the time. <laughs> you ever met somebody who loves to cook? Or it doesn't have to be cooking. It could be another hobby or interest or even, even an occupation. Somebody really loves what they do. They're happy and they, they want to share it with you. And they, they want you to get the enthusiasm about it. Somebody loves it. They want to tell you every ingredient and how they do it and how they simmered the oregano and mixed it with the cinnamon and, 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 and crossbred it with the, with, the, with, the, 
with the whipped cream, and nobody ever did that before, and that's why it's a taste explosion in your mouth, and, and you know, the origin of where it came, I don't care, I just know that it tastes good, that's all I know. But the same type of passion that somebody like that would have for what they're doing, I'm here to tell you, you can have that same type of passion in your prayer. Oh, you ought to praise them right there. See, you can be praying, you can be praying, and, 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 and you can need a whole bunch of stuff. God, you know what I need. I've been waiting, and you, know, you see the situation, and look, but you know what, God, I just, I just, I just want to hang out with you for a little while. How you doing? <laughs> What's going on, Lord? What's going on up in heaven? Show me a little bit. Let me see. Let me just enjoy your presence. You stop and think about it, all of the things that we chase in this life, all the things outside of ourselves, the hobbies, the interests, the money, the family, the friends, the, you know, the marriage or the potential for the marriage or the mate or the one that used to be the mate, whatever, the stuff that we find ourselves chasing, we can just be still and know that he is God. if you just, just took 15, 20 minutes out the day and instead of praying about all the stuff you need, probably it's the same prayer, it ain't but two or three things anyway that you need. What if you flip it? You know what, God, you know I need this, this, and this, and I can say it's already done, but let me just thank you for the last 25 things that you did because I saw I can, anything else would be too much to remember. I'd have to get a computer print out to try to even fathom some of what you've done over the years. God, let me just hang out. Let me just tell you how cool you are. Matter of fact, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be in a place of humility and bask in your glory. Oh, you ought to praise him. You ought to pra- stay right there. I wasn't going this way. See, if you have some people, some family or some friends that you love or, or a spouse, a loved one that you, that you really enjoy the company, sometimes you can hang out with them and it doesn't matter what you're doing. Sometimes you can sit in utter silence with somebody that you really care about and be totally comfortable. Why can't you do that with the Lord? Oh, you ought to praise him. Just go hang out with him. Whatever that means. If you're on your knees, if you're in your bed, if you're prostrate on the floor. Turn some praise music on in the car and just enjoy his presence. After you get to the place of praise where you feel that he's in the atmosphere. That's what the power of humility will produce. See, the humility puts you in a place to appreciate him more. And then the appreciation is the reverence, and then the reverence is, is, the, is the, 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 wow, he's really awesome. And then it's love. And then you can fall in love with his presence. And then you realize that, you know what, I, you know, I still need this miracle. And I believe it's already done, but, but I'm good. And, you know, the way I thought it might turn out, it didn't. But, you know, but God, I see what you did. And wow. And you bless me with more power, more peace, more patience, more love. And that was all found in the humility. Amen. Verse 10 says, humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up in the sight of the Lord. In other words, you, you reverence who he is. You reverence his power, his love. And the way you reverence it in the place of humility is by giving him back more love. Wow, that's deep. What does that mean? Go with me to Luke 17. I'm going to try to close it up. I see that I have already gone longer than I planned to. Look, 17 and 4. Now, I'm going to give you two or three points so that you understand where we're going. First of all, you, you need to stay in the place of forgiveness. Okay? This is oftentimes where you will get tripped up. Even if a Christian knows that you stay in a place of forgiveness and being loving sometimes, if you're going through your own trial or your tribulation, it puts you in a place to where you're a little bit more grumpy than usual. So your, your patience for other people sometimes is not what it used to be. And you, you might get annoyed or, 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 or you, you might get uh, moved out of the place of forgiveness because you already are kind of tense. Not you all, but it must be some other Christians. 
you have to remember because the enemy is going to try to use that as an obstacle. He's going to try to get you to be in the place of unforgiveness because if, if you're blocked in the place of forgiveness, then, then that means that you're blocked with the complete flow of the power of God. Forgiveness. Verse 14 of chapter 17 of the book of Luke, and it reads, And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns and repents, you shall forgive him. You shall forgive him. Him is your brother. Okay? Seven times. Seven times. In the book of Matthew, briefly, chapter 18 and verse 21, it speaks of a king, a very powerful king, and the king was settling accounts among his servants. And as he was looking at the accounts, he had a servant that... that owed him the equivalent of about $10 million in today's money. $10 million. Okay, now remember, this is written thousands of years ago, so a servant would be something akin to what we would call a slave. Okay, so you're a slave, and the king or the master finds out that you owe him $10 million. And if you can't put yourself in that position, flip it. Say, you're the king, you're the master, and you find out one of your servants owes you $10 million. $10 million. Some of y'all would be tripping over $25. $10 million. <laughs> $10 million. Look at your neighbor and say, $10 million. $10 So the king wants to put you in debtor's prison. He wants to sell off your family, sell your wife one way, sell the kids the other way, sell you another way so he can get some of his money back. And you go to the king and say, please, I, I'm so sorry, I don't have it. I don't know when I'm going to get it, but please show mercy. Please don't sell me off. Please don't sell my family. Please don't sell my kids. Or flip it. You're the king, and, and the servant comes to you, and you show mercy. You show mercy. Mercy. Something happens. A little more time goes by. That same servant loans some money to another servant, a peer. Not the king and the servant, it's a peer. And they loan $25 to one of his peers. And the peer didn't pay the $25 back and didn't have it. And he went buck wild, grabbed him, beat him. Threw him in jail because he wanted his $25. And the other servants heard about it. And they went and told the king. And the king was furious. Wait a minute. You owe me $10 million. And you, and I gave you mercy. I let you go. I left you where you were. I didn't even say anything. I give you love. And now that one of your peers owes you 25 measly little stinking dollars and you went crazy and showed him no mercy. You know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to put you with the tormentors. I'm going to put you in prison and you're going to be tormented until you can pay me back your debt. Now remember, it's $10 million. How are you going to pay that back? It's a debt you can't pay. Well, it's the same thing. Jesus the Christ went to the cross, and paid a price that none of us could repay. Amen. Oh, you ought to praise him right there. And what he paid allowed us, by believing in him, to be forgiven for our debts, our trespasses against the Father, being born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It allowed us to have life and to have eternal life and to have life more abundantly. And it's a debt that we could not ever repay and there was only a couple of things that he said to go along with it. Number one, love your brother. If your brother sins against you and repents, forgive him or her seven times 70. So as long as they repent, you stay in the place of forgiveness. It's not even about them. It doesn't matter what they did. It's so that you can stay right with God himself. Amen? You ought to praise him. First principle. And a lot of people don't realize how empowering that is if you do it. But they, don't, they also don't realize how stifling it is if you don't do it. Because then you're blocked. Okay? 
Go back to Luke. I'm closing soon. Luke 17. Immediately after that, if your brother sins against you seven times and repents seven times, you have to forgive him. Immediately, in verse 5, right after that, after they got that principle, you know what the apostle said? They said, Lord, increase our faith. In other words, I got that lesson. I'm ready to go to the next level. I got that. I got to stay in the place of forgiveness because if I can continue to give my brother or my sister, then that means you can continue to forgive me. If I'm in the place of forgiveness, your, your love, your power is flowing through me. I can access more faith. If I access love, love and faith and with your power, I can, I can speak more things into existence. I can operate more in the place of the miraculous. I can make more things happen in the kingdom. Lord, bless me with more faith. That's what they said. Let me jump with you to verse 7. Chapter 17 of Luke, verse 7. The next principle. I want you to catch this piece. I've already talked about it. I want you to understand. It says, and which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep would say to him who has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat, but would rather say, prepare me something for my meal. I I, I, I get the concept. Thousands of years ago, you're talking about a slave versus a master. The slave's been working in the field all day. They come in the house. Or come near the house. You say, you know what? Come here, servant. I need you to go in there and and cook my dinner for me because I'm hungry. They go in. They cook it. They stand by. They serve it. They wait until you finish eating before they eat themselves. Because it's a servant versus a, a king or a master. Jesus is king of kings. I want you to get that. As a servant, would you then say, well, thank you so much for doing something so, so fantastic. No, you wouldn't. You know why? Because it would be the servant's job. That would be the expectation. You follow me? You got up in the morning and you, and you brushed your teeth and washed your face. So, so, somebody say thank you? No, that's the expectation that you would do personal hygiene. It's, it's, it's your, your, your reasonable service for the position. So if the, the literal interpretation is by being a servant and performing the duties that are expected of you, there's no puffiness. There's no, you, you can't expect God to move because of what you have done, because the debt can never be repaid. You, you follow me? In other words, if you, if you stand on your works, you would be subject to the law, the Old Testament law. Jesus came under a new deal, so it's only through his grace and his mercy that you have access to his miracle-working power. It's not anything you can do. You can't work your way into the position. You follow me? Okay. The only way you can access more of his grace and his love is through the power of the humility. You reverence him in the humility. You come before him like a little child. You come with an open heart. You come expecting. You you come repentant. You stay in the place to where you can continually grow in him. You you come to him like like a child would to the father. See, sometimes as we get saved and we're in church for a long time and we get full of the word, we get full of the the, the interpretation, and we get full of the traditions, we lose sight of the most important part, which is to come before him humbly like a little child, to come before him open with the place of love, to come like a, like a new day. Like a, you ever see a little baby when they wake up and how sweet they are, how innocent they are? If we can stay in the place of that newness when we were baby Christians, that's where you have full access to his power. Amen? You stay in the place of forgiveness. The enemy is going to test you. The more, the bigger the miracle, the more you're going to have. You're going to have crazy people coming at you because the devil's trying to throw you off your mark. Especially if you got a strong personality, where back in the day you would have yanked somebody or smacked somebody. You're going to really be tested in that area. Forgiveness, because you got to stay. No matter what they do. No, I'm not saying sit there and get hit in the head with a hammer. Move out of the situation, but you want to stay in the place of being able to forgive. 
Okay, if you need to distance yourself, love them from a distance, but stay in the place to be able to forgive. The other side, stay in the place of being humble before God. Humble before him so you can access the free-flowing love between you and him and him and you. Amen. Amen. So you got two lines. Love him. He first loved us. Then he teaches us how to love him. He also says the second thing is to go love your brother. Stay in the place of, of forgiveness so that that part is constantly moving along with the part of loving him. So you got two parallels moving in the spirit. Two parallel bookends. If you stay between those bookends, then you can access the complete power. And if you go to chapter 17, verse 6 of the book of Luke, this is where we were going with the entire message. Amen? Amen. Verse 6. And this is right after verse 5 where the apostles asked for more faith. In verse 6, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can speak to the mulberry tree. That's a little bit different than it was in Mark, because in Mark it's talking about mustard seed faith, you can speak to the mountain and have it move and cast into the sea. And it's hard for us to imagine. But if you look at this one, if you have mustard seed faith, you can speak to the mulberry tree. Same concept, different example. The mulberry tree, very big tree, but it has deep roots, very deep and complex root system. And, and a mulberry tree can live for hundreds of years, so it's a formidable it's a formidable plant. It would be hard to imagine, almost as hard as, as speaking to the mountain and having to jump off the face of the planet into the ocean. It would be hard because, because it's not a tree that could be easily moved because the roots are so deep. But the reason that you can speak to it is because the roots are so deep. You don't only speak to the tree, you speak to the root. You bind that obstacle and you bind it by the root. I bind that mulberry tree and I bind it to the root. I speak that you, that the, I would curse every obstacle to the root and that it would be removed and planted in the sea, not just cast into the sea, planted so that the roots would then be planted over here so they would never show up again as an obstacle in my life. Amen. You ought to praise him right there. Not only do you speak to the mulberry tree and you speak to the root, but sometimes because it is such a big obstacle. Now, you've already prayed about it. You've already given it to God. You continue to thank God for it being already done. But you speak to the obstacle itself. You're not praying to God. You know, it's not repetition in your prayer, because they say if it's a repetition in prayer, it's your lack of faith. But what you're doing is you're continuing to speak to the root of that obstacle. And you're continuing to to speak the power into the removal of that obstacle. And you're continuing to, to and as you, as you continue to speak to that situation, your faith increases. But not only your faith, your knowledge of knowing it's already done, and, and you're changing the position of what it is, because in the first dimension, that looks like your complete reality. But remember, you're staying in the place of unforgiveness to your brother or your sister, and you're staying in the place of humility, which is the power of love for Jesus in you. And as you stay in those places, and continue to speak to the root of that obstacle, eventually it must change. And as you see it being manifest in the spirit realm, if you continue to speak it, it changes from position from being the natural reality into what was the natural reality. And as you call forth what is the spiritual reality into the first dimension reality, and there you have the first step of the co-creative power. If you learn to speak to the obstacle, to curse the root of that thing, to tell it where to go and where to take up root again so that it's no longer an obstacle in your life, then you no longer have opposition in that area, and then you can speak the blessing and the abundance in its place. I'm going to give you this example, and then I'm closing. If you had two really good football teams, we had the Super Bowl a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, 
Yeah, you know, everybody wanted Cam Newton. Everybody, I know, wanted Cam Newton to win. And, you know, God bless him, he couldn't do it. The, the defense was so overpowering that they, they, they were bound up. They bound up every move he had. So if you can imagine two opposing football teams, and then what if one of them is wiped off the field? What if you got a super bad football team and the other ones are gone? They go home early. Well, guess what? You can run touchdowns all day. You ain't got to run. You can walk. You can skip. You can moonwalk into the end zone. Well, the same is true even more so with your blessings. Once you fully understand that you have the power, the Lord Jesus Christ has already paid for it. You have the power to curse the obstacle the same way that it speaks of cursing the root to a mulberry tree, the same way it speaks of cursing a mountain and casting it into the sea. Now you have the concept of how to do it. And once you have the ability to curse it and remove the obstacle, you can run supernatural touchdowns all day long. Amen? All day long. All day long. All you have to do is just stay in the power of humility. Seek Jesus even the more. Seek his face even the more. And remember these principles. Give the Lord a praise.